Today on At the Forefront Live, you Chicago Medicine Comer Children's Experts will talk about how parents can best care for their kids' anxiety and trauma as well as their own during this stressful time. What are the primary causes of anxiety and trauma? How can families gain confidence or peace of mind? Dr. Siba Anam, Dr. Sonia Dinazulu, and Dr. Bradley Stoback will answer these and other questions from you during this live Q&A. That's coming up right now on At the Forefront Live. And we want to remind our viewers that today's program is not designed to take the place of a visit with your physician. Let's have each of you start by introducing yourselves and telling us a little bit about what you do here at UChicago Medicine. And Dr. Stoback, you were kind enough to join us in the studio, so we will start with you. Well, good afternoon. It's good to be here with you. Uh, my name is Brad Stolback. I am a trauma psychologist in the Department of Pediatrics here. And I've been working with children and families on the south side of Chicago for the last 25 years, um, focused entirely on providing services and programs for um, trauma. Uh, here, our programs specifically support families who've been affected by community violence um, and also um, young people who've been injured by that violence, uh, shot, stabbed, or assaulted. Um, and we also have programs that you might hear more about from our other guests that uh, support people dealing with other types of trauma. Perfect. And Dr. Anam, we'll go with uh, you next. Sure. Uh, I'm Siba Anam. I'm a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist here in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neuroscience. I work with uh, Brad Stolbeck and Sonia Dinazulu in the Recovery and Empowerment After Community Trauma Program, uh, providing psych psychiatric and psychopharmacological services. I also co-direct uh, the Mood and Anxiety Clinic here at the University of Chicago, and part of my specialization is providing culturally informed care, especially for children who've been affected by trauma and anxiety. And Dr. Denizulu? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sonia Denizulu, and I am also in the Department of um, Psychiatry, Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. I'm a clinical child psychologist, and I work with youth with all different clinical presentations, but my background is specializing working with youth exposed to trauma and violence. I also co-direct the uh, REACT clinic with Dr. Nam, and I'm also the director of the trauma programming um, in my department in psychiatry. Um, it's the University of Chicago Stress, Trauma, and Resilience Program. You know, you all do some some wonderful work with uh, the community here, and and uh, again, it's 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 I'm sure it's a tough job, but it's also got to be a gratifying uh, thing that you do working with these children and and their families. Let's jump right into the questions because we we're, we're at a very interesting time in in history and and a very trying time I think for a lot of families. And Dr. Stoback, I want to start with you just to kind of get your thoughts on. On, on what you've seen so far as people have, have dealt with this and, and dealt with the, the variety of <clears> issues <throat> that will come up with families and, and the challenges that come up with families. Just, if you can kind of just tell us what, what, you, what you see. Well, this is a very challenging time for all of us. Um, and so we see the longstanding stressors and uh, traumas and uh, difficulties that people have been dealing with for, for many years here um, related to violence as well as uh, the structural inequities in our communities. Um, and on top of that, uh, in recent months, we've had um, the uh, very public um, killings of black men by police um, that have led to a lot of protest. Um, and then we've had the pandemic. And so all of those things combined, uh, I think a lot of us are feeling anxious, uncertain about the future, um, and don't necessarily always have the, the best ways to communicate about that, um, even with each other, but also with our children. You know, Dr. Nam, it's, it's, it's interesting because I think you, Chicago medicine is somewhat unique just in, in the way that you know we're an academic medical center mm -hmm. we're in kind of the south uh, side of chicago in that general vicinity and hyde park obviously and and so it, it's it's we're kind of a unique place and the work we do or you do specifically with the the kids and the families here is is unique um 
you know, Dr. Stoback brought up health care uh, inequities mm -hmm. and, and some of the work that's happening there. What, what do you see from your standpoint with the, the children and families you deal with, and, and what are some of the, the challenges that we face? There are a number of challenges. Uh, just as Dr. Stolbach said, there's a long history of structural inequity that has uh, proved a challenge for children and families to access health care, specifically related to mental health. They're um, among some of the specific challenges that affect communities and communities of color include stigma that can prevent uh, people from wanting to seek help to offset some of the effects of the traumatic stressors and kind of anxieties that are affecting all of us. Um, one of the main challenges we have is that children don't often show up for um, appointments to help to offset some of those mental health concerns. What's also interesting is that children uh, may not express their anxiety or trauma in ways that um, are very easily distinguishable for adults. Um, sometimes they may not be able to voice their concerns with words. The expression can look very much like um, physical manifestations, like uh, stomach aches, headaches, um, freezing, crying. Um, it may also show up in kind of behavioral ways. Um, a lot of kids will suddenly seem more irritable. They may seem like they're having tantrums. And this is um, not necessarily identified as an expression of trauma or stress. Um, and that may preclude their ability to go and seek treatment for the concerns that you're actually having. And Dr. Denizulu, from your standpoint, you know, we, we are in trying times, I guess you could say, or unprecedented mm -hmm. times with the, the pandemic and, and uh, some of the other uh, incidents that uh, have been mentioned. Um, what are your thoughts and what's your take on, on the situation and, and what you've seen as a, uh, as a, a provider here? Yeah, so I echo everything that Dr. Nam and Dr. Stolbeck had already mentioned. Um, we're facing two pandemics. We're facing a pandemic that is involving social unrest, uh, particularly as it relates to racial trauma. And we're dealing with COVID-19. And certain populations, particularly African-American and Latinx population, are really um, exposed the most because we know there are higher rates in those populations as it relates to um, deaths associated with COVID-19. So. Um, as of late, within the past several months, we have received a lot of calls related to racial trauma. Um, we have received a, received a lot of calls related to those who have lost loved ones to COVID-19 um, or kids and families being really anxious about their loved ones going um, to work, so such as those who are essential workers, um, whether if they're in healthcare or in other, um, in other um, areas. So I think it's really important that when we think about what's happening, um, that we have to remember that uh, trauma and anxiety, uh, let me start with trauma. Trauma is more than just COVID-19 right now. We have to look at trauma as being experienced by those who are most vulnerable. So again, it's the COVID-19, losing a loved one to that, plus the, the, the racial trauma that's going on. Um, those combined um, is an accumulative stress, what we would say is accumulative stressors, and that in itself will have a different outcome from those who are just experiencing COVID-19 stressors. The anxiety too, I wanna highlight that, you know, anxiety is healthy to be to have anxiety. Um, and so, so it's okay for us to have this feeling of worry or nervousness or unease um, because we are in uncharted territories. We have to expect the unexpected but part of the thing about anxiety is you have to expect the unexpected during um, turbulent times like this. We'll talk more about it, I'm sure, about um, different ideas of how to cope with it, but I wanna highlight very much so um, the idea of us experiencing two pandemics and that everyone needs to be mindful of that and be responsive. You know, I, I think that's, that's certainly well put, and the fact that you have those things combined just makes, makes it tough. I mean, it's tough being Absolutely. a kid. It's tough being a parent, and yes. when you deal with all of this together, it's, it's just a real challenge for people. And, and I guess, first thing I wanna do, because I've, I, I would be remiss, I wanna remind mm -hmm. our viewers that we will take your questions, and we've got about a half hour in the program. So type them in the comment section, we'll get to as many as possible over the course of the program. But let's get kind of, let's kind of start at the beginning. And Dr. Stoback, I'll ask you this first question. Can you tell us the definition of anxiety and, and trauma and, and what we're dealing with here? So um, anxiety, it can be part of trauma and the response to trauma, um, but there is an important difference, right? So trauma is really um, overwhelming threat that one experiences that can't be integrated 
into the brain, into the memory, into the self in the way that normal experience is integrated. After that happens, um, it gets split off, it gets pushed away. And then we function as though uh, we're either still in that traumatic situation, we're under constant threat, or we function as though it never happened. And so people will go back and forth between those two ways of functioning. Um, one of the manifestations of that can be anxiety or worry or fear about uh, the trauma recurring or about other things happening. Um, and, and it is different from anxiety that many people um, experience who have not experienced a specific traumatic event. Mm -hmm. um, and that anxiety can be related to the general demands of life, it can be related to relationships, it can be related to the other stressors that we're experiencing, um, and particularly um, those stressors that come with the inequities that we've been talking about. Um, and a, as Dr. Dinizulu said, that kind of anxiety is um, a normal part of life, right? Um, and it, it, in both, um, when it becomes a problem is when the anxiety or the traumatic reactions that we're talking about control us rather than us feeling like we're in charge of them. And how do you know when you get to that stage? Because I think, you know, it's, and, and Dr. Dinizu, you, you mentioned this earlier that, you know, some anxiety in life is, is natural and, and mm -hmm. can in fact even be healthy, but how do you know when you get to that level when it's, it, when it's not? And I don't know who wants to take that question. Yeah, I can answer that question. So, uh, like we said, anxiety is a, a natural emotion. We have it. Um, you know, some um, examples of healthy anxiety is like performing for a group of people, public speaking, um, you know, worrying about, you know, um, taking a test. Like those are, you know, uh, normal ways of experiencing anxiety. When it becomes a problem is when it really does interfere with um, daily functioning. So it becomes really excessive, very consuming. And what it looks like for children is that, you know, some, some types of anxiety for children specifically could be related to around social interactions with peers or other people. They may not want to interact with anyone because they're just too anxious. Um, and that, and, you know, and for children, socialization is extremely important, right? It's a, it's a key part of development as well. Um, some other aspects could be separation anxiety, like they don't want to leave their primary attachment figure or caregivers. Um, and so it may be really hard to separate. Um, sometimes kids can be really worried about everything. When we say generalized anxiety, they may be worried about their parents' safety, their own safety. They may be worried about, um, you know, performance at school. So they, they're generally worried about a lot of different things. Um, and so when it becomes a problem, again, is when it interferes with their daily functioning, such as they may have difficulty sleeping or eating, um, socializing with other people. They're constantly worrying about the, the thing, the thoughts um, that makes them really anxious. Um, instead of being able to be flexible and being able to shift their attention or shift their emotions and, and be able to adapt to a stressful situation. So when that happens, that's when it's really important, you know, to talk to the primary care provider or to seek, um, you know, services in psychiatry um, or other professionals to help with um, getting a better understanding of your child's anxiety. Dr. Anam, this uh, next question I want to go ahead and throw to you because um, it, it's from a viewer and and there are a couple of things I want to talk about here. So let me ask the question first, and then we'll unpack just a little bit more after that. But the question is, are there any at-home strategies that can be done to alleviate anxiety and trauma in teens? And of course, what they're, the reason they're asking that question is due to COVID. And then, then mm -hmm. after that, I, I want to talk a little bit more about the safety of care here at UChicago Medicine during COVID and some of the other alternatives through uh, video visits and things like that. So let's start with the question though, any at-home strategies uh, to deal with uh, teens who are experiencing uh, a trauma or an anxiety? Absolutely, so we do expect that um, there will be an increased amount of stress or anxiety related to the number of uncertainties that people are dealing with at this point in time. Um, for parents specifically, one of the key things that parents can do to support their kids is kind of model and manage your own anxiety. So kids really look to their parents for cues as to how to react to specific situations, especially those of um, an uncertain nature, situations they have not yet confronted. They really are looking to their parents. 
So if parents are able to model for them a healthy, resilient response to anxiety-provoking situations, this can actually have a really lasting impact on how kids themselves manage to deal with anxiogenic or anxiety-provoking situations in the future. There are a number of specific tools a lot of people have engaged in kind of mindfulness-based stress reduction mindfulness-based stress reduction activities. Um, routines and rituals are really critical. Um, Structure is important to continue to impart, even though we don't currently have the same structure that we're used to in terms of school functioning, camps, um, social relationships like playdates and sleepovers. We may not all be able to access those in the same ways. As much as we can keep up some routines and rituals, social connections, they will really be critical in helping kids to manage um, the number of stressors that they're dealing with currently. And I know that Dr. Denizulu and Dr. Stolbeck have a number of um, other kind of home-based uh, stress reduction activities that may be useful as well. Yeah, let's let's go okay. to each one of you and, and kind of get your thoughts on that one. And so while well, we have the triple box up, Dr. Denizulu, let's uh, let's go with you next, and then Dr. Stolbeck will will uh, yeah, so be our cleanup hitter. So to add on top of what Dr. Nam said, uh, routines and rituals both for anxiety, both for trauma is yes. really important. Um, establishing a sense of safety. So routines and rituals is what um, can help, you know, that's usually, uh, establishing a sense of safety is usually the first line of defense when we try to help people recover from a trauma. Um, so routines and rituals, whether if you're having anxiety or trauma or both, that is just key. And families naturally have those things. So I would take inventory of what you do and maybe amp it up a little bit more. Um, because consistency, predictability, and reliability is so important when it comes to recovering from things that are potentially frightening or have been frightening in the past. So I highly recommend that. Um, the other piece, too, that I want to highlight um, is, you know, parents need to have compassion for themselves. Uh, it's okay to yes. not be okay. <laughs> yeah. We Again, it's okay. It really is. But what we do need to understand is that, um, the things that makes us anxious is that we're worried about the things that haven't happened again, right? Anxiety is always worrying about the future, typically. Um, we understand that some things have happened in the past, you know, again, around COVID-19 and, um, and trauma, there are things that have happened to other people, maybe within our own um, circle of family support and friends, um, that bad things may have happened, so you're worried about if it's gonna happen to you or the other loved ones. So yes, that is those are potential threats, and we should. I'm not saying that you should not feel um, or disregard your anxiety around it. But what I'm saying is that with anxiety, um, we have to expect the unexpected. We have to understand that we can't control everything. But what we do know, in order to manage through COVID-19, um, what we do know is that wearing masks, for example, staying six feet apart, um, we have some things that are within our control that we can try to, to the best of our ability, implement and keep us safe, right? So the mask wearing around COVID-19, staying socially distant, those are the two key tools that we have. Hand washing, of course, there's a whole bunch of things, but um, those two things are really important factors that we know that we can control. And if we're in different situations, we have those things to rely upon. As it, as it relates to trauma, and I'm speaking particularly more so to um, different racial and ethnic groups uh, that's traditionally um, underrepresented, um, so in order to deal with the racial unrest, the racial trauma that's associated with it, um, a lot of cultural socialization um, and also preparing for bias. So those are the two things that we learn, particularly when we work with um, parents and try to help the parents become more um, prepared for racial trauma. You know, messages about your own culture and your own identity is really important. And participating in those activities are really important. And then preparing for bias. Um, you know, we, you know, particularly with African Americans and Latinx groups, for example, there are biases against us. So we have to help our children and our teenagers understand how do we prepare. It doesn't mean that we have to mistrust because that's a whole nother level that can produce more anxiety and depression, we found. Um, so saying to somebody, to your children, don't trust these people uh, might be hard for them to hear because it can cause some confusion because you should be skeptical of anybody. Um, if there's some people that you don't trust, it, they can be from any background, but preparing for bias, meaning like, okay, because I'm of this demographic and background, I need to be a little bit more careful of how people may perceive me in the dominant group. Um, and so preparing your kids with those tools of how to deal with bias is actually really supportive um, in times like this as well. And Dr. Stolbeck. So I, I, I think what that Dr. Denzu is saying is so important and it, it really highlights the importance of communication and communicating 
with our children um, and to do it in a way that does not um, make them feel like they're crazy or that there's something wrong with them for feeling what they're feeling. Um, so one of the ways that we do that is to actually acknowledge our own feelings, right? That we're feeling uncertain, we're feeling anxious, um, and we will get through it together, we will support mm -hmm. each other through it together. Um, one of the key tools that we use um, with, in our adult brains, right, to manage uh, and regulate our emotions and our responses to things um, is by using language, to talk about it, to put words into it, to make sense of it. Our children are not equipped to do that mm -hmm. in the same way. And so one of the things that's so important is that we help them by doing it for them and with them. Excellent. So we do have several questions from viewers, so I want to get to as many of these as we, we can as we uh, jump into the, the, the latter portion of the program. Uh, how can a parent help a child coping with PTSD? What is a healthy way to help them process it so uh, it doesn't hurt their development into adulthood? And I don't know who would want to take that one, but it's a good question. Well, I'll start because it really picks up on what I was just talking about. Uh -huh. That um, the first thing that we do uh, with someone after a trauma has occurred is to talk to them about the fact that they may be having these reactions. Um, in their bodies, like they're back there at the time when it happened. That may be that they feel um, all of a sudden extremely frightened or like they need to get away. It might be all of a sudden they feel like they need to fight or they feel very angry. It might be more of a flashback that they're actually uh -huh. really back there at the time when it happened. And um, when those things happen, we feel like we're going crazy. And so to let uh, people know that if that does happen, you're not crazy. It's completely normal. And what helps is to remember where we are and when we are, and to remember that right now, even though there may be threats in the environment right now, we're safe. Um, and so to remember, it's Tuesday at 4 o'clock. It's not last Wednesday, right? Um, and, and I'm here in my house, I'm not out on the block. Um, so that's um, one of the key things. Um, the other thing is it, it's important to um, have professionals available that can talk because when your child has been through a trauma, you also have been through that trauma. And when I'm traumatized by something, it really limits my ability to uh, support someone else who's traumatized by that same thing. And so to, to, um, it's not any sign of weakness to be seeking out help from people who specialize in, in this kind of work. And one of the things that uh, I promised we would talk about a moment ago and then I skipped over it, it is safe to come to UChicago Medicine for treatment for a variety of, of treatments. Um, we're, we're very careful about that. So we want yes. to encourage anybody if they do need treatment, they need help, they can certainly contact uh, one of their providers and, and it's a safe place to be. And we also do a lot of video visits yes. now too, yes. which is I think fantastic. I don't, have you all been doing the, the video visits? Yes, actually our programs have been almost 100% um, telemedicine yes. um, for the last several months. I, I love what we're showing now on the screen ah. because here we go with some <laughs> online video visits and this kind of shows yeah. I think the value of it, and I don't know, Dr. Dinazulu or Dr. Anam, if you want to jump in on this and, and talk about your experiences with doing these video visits, but it, it's like a house call. Absolutely. Um, I am actually, I was hoping that uh, one of our team would mention that um, it is critical to kind of start the process early to um, start to seek treatment, talk to a professional when you have experiences of anxiety or depression or trauma, because they can limit the impact and severity of you know, that incident or that situation on long-term development. We have an expanded capacity, fortunately, um, to provide these services now at University of Chicago. And just like Dr. Stolbeck said, and I'm sure Dr. Denizulu will echo, 
almost all of our services currently are done remotely, which is wonderful because it allows us to have access to more patients who, you know, have had a hard time managing several kids and babysitting and jobs. So, you know, we have a lot more capacity, which also in some ways allows us to see patients who we would not have been able to see otherwise. So um, it's really a good time, I think, to start to link in because we have more capacity in terms of workforce and also more capacity in terms of platforms in which we can see patients. Dr. Dinesulu, one of the things that another uh, provider had told me before, it's like, it is like a house call and you're, you're right there in the, the patient's home so you can see the interaction yeah. and that sort of thing. So that's gotta be kind of kind of helpful, I would imagine. Yeah, it's very helpful. Um, we get to see a different perspective of our patients and they get to see us too, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so it goes both ways. Um, but it allows for more. I think it's, it's even stronger rapport building because now we're, we're introducing a different part of our lives. So it's it's been really cool to see um, some of the kids that I see and their families. And to me, it feels like we have even a better connection sometimes. So yeah, it's, it's really, it's a nice feature and it's not going away. It's here to right. stay. No. I agree. I think it's I think it's wonderful, and I'm so glad that we, we we're doing this as an institution and embracing it because it's I think it's really great. Is anxiety in children more common at a certain age? Another viewer question there. I would not say that it's more common at a yeah. certain age, but that the way that it manifests is yes. different at sure. different okay. ages. Um, yeah. Separation anxiety is really normal at an early age, um, and. Uh, but it can, it can be an issue um, really at all ages, especially with trauma. Okay. But in general, um, the way that it manifests may look different. And Dr. Anam talked a lot about some of the different things that you might see. So with younger children, you might be more likely to see physical complaints, stomach aches or headaches, um, versus them saying that they feel anxious. So, so Dr. Adam, here's another question from a viewer. My daughter has sure. lupus. My son uh, has, I believe it's a, a prexia of speech. We take mm -hmm. quarantine very seriously, but I want to try to keep a good balance between staying safe and not causing too much anxiety. Can you mm -hmm. give advice relating to maintaining that healthy balance? And that is the million dollar question, I think, for our parents right there. That, that is healthy the balance. million dollar question. Yeah. I wish I could answer it with, uh, with <laughs> that I'd get that million dollars. Um, I think it's really critical to take stock of kind of what are your children's needs? What are the things that help them feel secure, supported, and safe um, in this situation? I think it's very hard to do a one-size-fits-all. I think you have to consider, just like you said, you have some medical concerns that are specific to your kid. You're very concerned as a parent for doing optimally what is going to get your child through this period with a safe and healthy way and not con um, not compromise their development. I think it's tricky. Um, I think the most important thing to you, you are the expert in your child. You know what their needs are. And I think what um, can be helpful is if you're noticing that your child is not developing, they're, they're having impairment in terms of their ability to engage with things that give them life, that give them happiness, that give them joy. If they're avoiding situations that have been helpful to them, that's when you start to think, maybe I could use some more support because they're avoiding social relationships. They're avoiding, they're avoiding kind of school or academic functioning. They're not spending as much time with family. Can we use some more support in helping us um, get our child through this difficult period? Uh, but I think it's really important to kind of partner with your healthcare provider and use your combined expertise in helping care for your child. We are about out of time, but I have another question from a viewer that I really want to ask. And, and Dr. Denizulo, I think I'm going to throw this one to you. It's it's, it's basically about attending school as we get back into the fall. There's two questions here, so I'll just give you both and let you take a shot at it. So what about anxiety with either not attending school in person during the fall or with attending, attending school but with modified social mm. engagement and that sort of thing? And then another one is what can educators recommend to parents to support children that may experience challenge in transitioning back to school or, or not transitioning back to school? This is a this yeah. is a tough one because, as you mentioned Big earlier, question. the social aspect for children is so important, and school plays a, a critical role in that. Obviously, yeah, yeah, that's 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 a billion dollar question as well. <laughs> um, I know I need more time than a minute to answer this, but just real <laughs> quickly, um, again, we have to make decisions based on the information that's before us. So today they may say we're opening school; it might be a hybrid, but come. September here in Chicago, 
um, or late August, you know, for those areas um, in the suburbs, you, you may not be going back to school fully. It all depends. Um, you have to, you know, be able to follow the guidelines, you know, read the guidelines, make sure the school is also implementing the guidelines by the CDC. And it's really going to have to be a family decision. Um, and, and again, expecting the unexpected is just knowing what information is before you and let that be your guiding, you know, talking to your primary care physician, talking to any other family members that may need to help you decide this, but you don't have to be alone in making these decisions. And whatever you decide, you're not going to be the only parent and family that's going to make that this uh, decision that's different from everybody else. It's going to be other people in the same boat with you. We're all in it together. Some people may go back to school. Some people may not opt to go back to school. And that's okay. You just have to make whatever decision um, that's best for your family, given the information that is before you in that moment. We have information. You just have to be able to use it to help you make that decision out of time. We'll have another At the Forefront Live next week and please remember to check out our Facebook page for our schedule of programs coming up in the future. Also, if you want more information about UChicago Medicine, take a look at our website at uchicagomedicine.org. If you need an appointment, you can give us a call at 888-824-0200. And also remember, you can schedule your video visit by going to the website. They're, they're very, very good and, and very, very critical. Thanks again for being with us today and I hope you have a great week.